Hi, so um, this is uh, called a holy consecration, the encounter and sancti sanctification of the call, and it pertains to Isaiah 6, uh, uh, or chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. Um, and basically, <clears throat> uh, Isaiah has been faithful to prophesy the truth to the people of Jerusalem before King Uzziah died, suddenly and unexpectedly. For many, King Uzziah had been a bastion of strength for the nation. As a most goodly and reputable king who reigned for 52 years. And there was a pervasive feeling of instability that rippled through the entire culture of the nation at the onset of his death, which is really palpable in the first verse of Isaiah chapter 6. In the middle of the swirl of instability and social unrest that Isaiah finds himself, it is in that that he finds himself caught up in a very unexpected vision. And in the vision, Isaiah is taken to the temple where the Lord um, of all lords and the king of all kings is sitting highly enthroned in majesty. So magnificent and all-consuming is his being that even the train of his robe consumes the entire temple. What an eyeful. As that vision commensurates, Isaiah really pronounced, is pronouncedly aware of how much more omnipotent, mighty, altogether massive, God is above all other kings, and suddenly the circumstances of the deceased monarch, King Uzziah, holds no real bearing on the weight of the world in comparison with this king of glory that is seated on the throne. Um, the seraphim and the supreme transcendency of God's holiness is the next part, which is uh, in verses 2 through 3, as Uzziah is or sorry, as Isaiah is captivated by the altogether incomprehensible strength and might of his holy king, his eyes are able are are able to take um they're not sorry, they are not able to take in the fullness of the one seated on the throne. He can see the massive robes, but the description of God's majesty are not given more attention. And it's likely because the king seated on high was so holy and impossible to take in. God, God's being was too much to behold and potentially even frightening. One can only imagine that if the vision of God was anything like what Moses encountered on Mount Sinai, then when God passed before him, God protected Moses by keeping him from seeing his face by hiding him in the cleft of the rock so that only his hind parts could be seen. The Lord told Moses, no one could look upon his face and live in Exodus 33, 20 through 23. Isaiah's attention fixates next on the seraphim who were, or were very peculiar looking creatures standing above where the Lord was sitting. And each had six wings, two that hid their face, two that covered their feet, and two for flying. These seraphim were consumed with the glorious holiness of God, and they could not help but recognize and affirm and worship the one seated on the throne. They cried out, holy, 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 taking in and responding to the limitless expressions of his perfection, worth, and supreme transcendency that sets him apart from all others. The seraphim not only cried in response to God's limitless majesty, but they also declared that the earth could not help but be filled with his glory. That declaration expresses the utmost expansiveness and omnipresence of the Lord. He's so vast and immense that his glory literally fills the entire earth. Nothing is untouched or unresponsive to his glory. Um, in uh, chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, we are going to address the shaking and humbling 
and Eden. As they spoke, the entire temple began to shake completely off from the foundations and smoke began to pour into the temple and to fill it. At this point, Isaiah comes completely undone as he realizes in fear and trembling that he stands unworthy, unworthily before a holy God and he feels all of his sinfulness and um, he becomes painfully aware that he deserves death and judgment in the presence of one so holy. He was coming face to face with his sin, just like Adam and Eve had in the garden when they had sinned and God sought to talk with them in the cool of the day. In Genesis 3, 8 through 9, they were ashamed, realizing they were naked and completely exposed. With their state of sin, they hid because they could not stand before their loving and holy creator and commune with him and walk with them as had previously been their custom. Actions always have consequences. And the consequences of Adam and Eve's disobedience severed the close and very personal connection and relationship they had with the Lord. You cannot choose sin, which stains and corrupts your soul and riddles you with shame and continue a relationship with the perfect and holy God, the one that you chose to break connection with. They sadly had severed their soul from the creator who loved them deeply. And now the only way for them to one day be redeemed meant they must be purged from the garden that God had created for them. Otherwise, they might eat from the tree of life and live throughout eternity separated from God and unredeemable. Death is conquered Death is, sorry, death is the consequence of sin. And he had to remove them from the garden so that they, so he could begin the work of redeeming them, which <clears throat> we also see um, in Genesis uh, 3, 22 through 24, that he did that. It was this same gravitas revelation that punctuated Isaiah's heart as he stood unworthily before the most High, holy God in his sinful state. He was worthy of death because he was a man of unclean lips and lived among people with profane, unclean lips. And yet here he found himself in holy fear and trembling, standing before the most holy God and King. <clears throat> in uh, chapter six, six through seven, um, it addresses purified consecration. At the very next moment, wait, oh, so sorry, I think I, oh yeah, that's right. Um, at the very next moment, Isaiah saw his sinful state and believed that he would surely die. The sovereign hand of the Lord intervened in a powerful way. God heard Isaiah's fear-filled cry and responded to his heart of repentance. One of the seraphim flew to Isaiah carrying a live coal straight from the altar Touching the coal to Isaiah's lips, he said, Listen carefully, this has touched your lips. Your wickedness, your sin, and your injustice and wrongdoing is taken away, and your sin is atoned for and forgiven. Imagine the amazement and relief that washed over Isaiah as this took place. He was no longer going to face death and destruction for his sin. God had purified him and taken away his sin and his reproach, and he did not have to be terrified in the presence of the king of all kings. This disconnection and relationship that had taken place between God and humanity was still in place. But God had chosen to reconcile this relationship with Isaiah and pardon and purify him. That was the precursory moment before God called and ordained Isaiah as his prophet and it was the moment that marked the rest of his life. He lived now in connection and relationship with God, something many in that day could not experience. God had set him aside as a mouthpiece and touched his, touched his mouth at the time of his calling. This experience of being called and having his mouth consecrated was also shared 
by Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9 and Ezekiel 3 verses 1 through 3. With Jeremiah during his consecration, the Lord touched his mouth and placed his very words in Jeremiah's mouth. And with Ezekiel, the Lord gave him a scroll, which he was instructed to eat, and it carried the words that he was created to deliver to his people. God intentionally and strategically fostered personal relationships with his prophets and encountered them in such a precise way as to transform them into fruitful, consecrated mouth pl- mouthpieces to deliver his very words to his people. What an incredible honor. This special consecration and rekindling of the relationship with humanity that had been lost in the garden is really demonstrated beautifully with how God chose to build relationships with his chosen prophets. It's a foreshadowing of Christ and the promise that was to come where Christ would once and for all reconcile the lost world back to God through himself by putting to death the sin that separated us from God and seeing how God connected so powerfully and unreservedly with Isaiah and the other prophets is a powerful reminder of the kind of relationship we all have free access to with God through Christ. There is no more barrier of separation for those who accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Praise God.